Russell, I am honored that you granted me an interview. Uh, I want to educate you on a piece of data that you are missing. The missing data that you right now is there are tons of ex-Scientologists who have formed groups, 30,000 here, 10,000 members here, 40,000 ex-Scientology message board, and all these newer generation can buy your book Bare-Faced Messiah from Amazon. So it has nothing to do with, is it published in America or not? Because you just mouse click and Russell Miller's book can be purchased online, on eBay, on Amazon, and so on. So you are quite on people's radar as a masterpiece journalistic biographer. I know you thought, well, that I wrote it a long time ago. No, you, your current news. And I thought you should know that. Well, thank you. Um, I'm delighted it's available and, and um, I'm delighted that people can read it still, even though the, um, the church did everything they possibly could to prevent publication in the United States. Yes, yes, yes. However, you won. You won in Canada. You went to you, Canada, Australia, South Africa, United King, United Kingdom. They took it all the way up to even the final court is the Lords, right? And the Lords yep. refused to even hear it and chucked it down. <laughs> well, they they applied to take it to the Lords, and the and the High Court in London refused to did, Ref did not give them permission to do that. I see, I see. Now, you were very um, astute as a biographer. You decided that the three hottest buttons that the public were interested in were sex, money, religion. And you decided to do a, a biography on each of those three categories, Hugh Hefner and his sexual, his his Playboy bunnies and all that, and then Paul C. Getty, the billionaire for money, and then L. Ron Hubbard on religion. That's the way you devised. Was L. Ron Hubbard the That's third true. in your triage? Was he he L. was, Ron yeah. Hub yeah. Yeah. L. Ron Hubbard. Little. Little did you think what you were in for by <laughs> choosing Hubbard. Huh? No, no, you had no idea. Not. I mean, well, as, as time progressed, um, people were telling me that I was going to be sued and that it would be, you know, lots of difficulties getting it published. And um, but by then I was far down the road, and I um, and I wasn't going to be put off from publishing it by this spurious church, or indeed. Um, any of the threats that were made against me, but um, it was a proper, leg legitimate pro uh, project, and um, I wanted to finish it. I I had a lot of admiration for your publisher, who apparently was offered a million dollars in the nineteen eighties to sacrifice yeah. the rights, and he turned it down. They Russell, did turn it down, and. Hmm. Well, but thank goodness they did turn it down because uh, they realized, of course, that the church wasn't didn't want to buy the rights to publish the book. They wanted to buy the rights to bury the book. Um, and my publisher, to its great credit, um, refused that deal, um, even though they were under tremendous pressure from their ins their own insurance company. Because, as you know, in the United States, a ferocious litigant with access to unlimited sums of money can keep a court case going for a long, long time by delaying tactics and moving from one state to another or, or move one court to another. And so the, the, the publisher fought the case, fought to get my book published very valiantly, and they turned down the church's offer of a million uh, dollars. Um, but in the end, the insurance company said, look, you know, we, we really can't continue to cover the legal costs 
because there didn't seem to be any end in sight. And, and so the publisher, which was Henry Holt, they did everything they could to bring the book out um, in, in a sensible and, and honorable way. But in the end, they were forced to um, abandon it. And with, with great regret, they said, you know, we can't continue because the insurance company won't cover our, our legal costs anymore. And it looked like the church was never going to end. It looked like the church was going to go on and on and on until finally they got the book book banned in the United States. Very, very sad. Even though you stressed from the beginning, this was not a book on Scientology, the doctrines, the body patents, the, you know, the, the, the Xenu and the volcanoes exploding. No, this was not, they can believe what they wanted to believe. You wanted to investigate the incredible glory glorious affirmations about Hubbard and his military career and his achievements. So you were focusing on Hubbard, not not the Scientology religion, the Hubbard, correct? I was focusing entirely on the man. And the reason I was be- is, is this. Um, I, I was working as a journalist for the Sunday Times magazine at the time, um, and I was frequently in America. And Hubbard had disappeared gone to ground for for several years. No one knew where the hell he was. And I said to the magazine, look, while I'm in America and I've got lots of downtime, why don't I see if I can find where he is? If I can find him, we have a great scoop. If, um, if I can't find him, we have a greater mystery. So either way, it would have worked you know, as, a, as a journalistic project. And um, what happened was that um, I got, I knew... I made some progress about where he was. I knew he was somewhere near San Luis Obispo. I wasn't quite sure oh. the exact detail, oh. but but it was close. It was close. And then uh, then one morning I was um, in the bath and listening to the radio, and the news was that L. Ron Hubbard had died. And I thought, well, by then I knew so much about L. Ron Hubbard that um, it was an opportunity to turn it into the, a book, the third of my initial three biographies. And so that's what I did. Um, and um, in many ways, you know, I was I was never particularly interested in, in the church because I'm not really qualified to discuss or or examine you know, whether or not this is a church or not a church or what what its beliefs were. But um, I was fascinated by L. Ron Hubbard because I discovered I already knew by then that almost everything the church has said about L. Ron Hubbard, the whole lot from his early childhood to his maturity after the after the war and as a so-called explorer, almost everything they claimed, as I slowly uncovered it, was a lie. And it was fascinating to me um, as a journalist to realize you know, everything I touched, was he the youngest Eagle Scout? Well, I called the Eagle Scouts of America and said, was he the youngest? said, we have no idea because we don't keep record of the age of Scouts. So as, as these lies were uncovered, um, I realized there was a fantastic opportunity to really tell the true story of L. Ron Hubbard, which is exactly what I tried to do. Yes, the book is quite uh, riveting. I, I remember staying up. It was two in the morning, three in the morning. I'm still reading. I could not put <laughs> it down. Remember that I worked with Hubbard on the Apollo, and I totally, I totally be- I wanted to believe. I wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> the, the old line in the song, a man believes what he wants to believe and disregards the rest. That's a line exactly, from yeah. si- Simon and Garfunkel. Can you just... It is, I recognize it. <laughs> yeah. Can you just uh, briefly tell me, uh, tell the audience uh, a couple more spectacular falsehoods that you discovered were complete exaggeration. Well, um, well, everything from childhood, growing up in his grandfather's ranch, covering a quarter of the state of Montana, nonsense. Um, that he was, um, uh, you know, graduated from George Washington University, wrong. That he was an explorer, no, he wasn't. Uh, but the major, the major issue in terms of his his story of his own life was about his war record. And um, 
and you know as the ch- uh, you will know that the church claims he he operated behind the lines in all five theaters of war that he won 32 or 34 medals or whatever it was it was all lies and i i i got his the whole re- whole record of his war service which was thousands of pages of documents about five or six inches high uh, from the freedom of information act through the national archives which um was a wonderful facility for people like me and what was interesting about the war record is that it was it was seamless you know that 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 um it tracked him from here to there from what what he'd done um in in one place or another and it indicated he hadn't been had hardly been abroad at all he certainly had not fought in any of the theaters of war certainly he wasn't fighting behind the lines certainly he didn't win all these medals that they claimed he'd won and um uh, you know it was clear from the record itself, there, there were bills that he hadn't paid his tailor. There was um, courts of inquiry about what he'd been up to, you know, and he was censured over and over again. He was a terrible officer in the United States Navy. He was not a hero. He was more of a coward trying to avoid service in, in any kind of uh, theater of war. And and he was clearly a nightmare to all of his all of his commanders. You know, they, they, they were... Um, on re- on the record instances of being, this officer is entirely unsuited for this he's entirely unsuited for that he was a total total nightmare a coward and um avoided any kind of confrontation certainly military conversation um so uh, that that was a major for me that was a major achievement discovering his true war record because you know the, the church relied very much on the fact that here was this man who was an incredible hero He'd fought behind the lines in all five theatres of war. He won all these medals. It was all nonsense from beginning to end. Wow. They have a, a gallery of his life done with high electronics. You push buttons and pictures come up. On Hollywood Boulevard, it's called the L. L. Ron Hubbard Museum. It's free. And they still have this these glory, glorified war records. And the humble Joe Schmo walking down, he, he he hasn't read Russell Miller. So this is all swallowed as truth. Um, yeah. You must have seen his letter asking for psychiatric help because the war had emotionally died. No, I think he wanted, I'm not sure if he wanted military benefits or if he wanted he psychiatric. Did. He wanted... No, uh, fundamentally, he's trying to get some uh, veterans' aid assistance after the war, and it, I think it was rather funny actually the way he would create wounds that actually he hadn't sustained, and he seemed to be staggering from one VA office to another to try and convince them that he really was a veteran who was suffering deeply from his. You know, the church said he was blind and crippled at the end of the war, where he was actually walking around VA offices all over the place, mainly in California, trying to get a bigger pension. So, I mean, some of it I thought was very funny, the things that he was doing, because he was making up these mad stories about what had happened to him. Um, and, uh, and, and he was convincing a lot of people, as indeed later on, of course, he convinced so many thousands of members of the Church of Scientology uh, that his his biography was was. Uh, admirable and heroic and and uh, you know wonderfully um, detailed but of course uh, what nobody would accept um, until the book came out and even when the book came out they didn't accept it it was a pack of lies from beginning to end mm. there's an opening paragraph that says blinded and crippled after world war ii he used dianetics to heal he was never blinded and he was not a cripple. You say he was running around on both legs. He wasn't no. a cripple. Um, yeah, no, no. Why Why do you think he had such a animosity to psychiatry? He asked for psychiatric help. Why do you think he got more and more bitter and antagonistic towards psychiatry? I- Karen, I never really got to the bottom of that. It's interesting that that he be, did become, you know, so antagonistic towards psychiatry. But um, I I never understood it. Maybe it was because 
he was terrified that a psychiatrist would you know, actually discover the truth about him, that he was living a, a, a lie, a pack of lies the whole of his life. I don't, I don't really know, as, as indeed I never got to grips with the whole business of Dianetics. You know, where did it come from? How did he create this, this best-selling book out of nowhere? And those are issues that I, I was never able to address. And in some ways, I didn't need to because I was concentrating on him, on him as an individual and on his life, on the reality of his life, rather than the life portrayed by the church. So uh, he was a fantastic storyteller. Huh? Yeah, that, that's what he did. And that's, I mean, he was tremendously successful at that. Um, and, you know, the fact that he was a tremendous storyteller enabled him to, um, first of all, create this fictional biography of his life, and secondly, to support it. And as you know, when when um, Jerry Armstrong was got his permission to write the biography, Jerry Armstrong was astonished that he kept discovering that, that what the stories that had been put about uh, Hubbard, one after another, turned out to be not true. And he found it very difficult to believe. And he kept thinking there must be an explanation for this. Obviously, he's not been lying because he couldn't believe that L. Ron Hubbard would lie about anything. But actually, in the end, of course, he did discover that the whole thing was a pack of lies. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I don't know how much you followed later history. I know you moved on with your life. Oh, boy. Imagine looking out of your looking out of your abode and seeing the ocean. What a, what a, ooh. How, how incredible to have an oceanic view. And, and. <laughs> well, it's nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was thinking of asking you. I know you didn't keep burrowing back into keeping up with Scientology, but I want to tell you what shattered my, literally, I had an explosion in my head. Hubbard wanted to kill himself at the end. Did you know that? He ordered his caretaker, I didn't know that, a, guy, a guy called Sarge, to build him an e-meter that would give him such a jolt of electricity that he would die. And the reason he wanted that was he wanted that because he said he had a body thetan, an attached spirit, that was evil. And with all the techniques he had evolved, he could not get rid of this bad spirit. And he felt with the heavy electrical jolt and s the very few people around him knew this was a suicide mission to build with that volume of electricity you so anyway i'm just telling you when i was told this story and the guy who was being ordered to make this machine, this death suicide e-meter, he was just, he mentally <laughs> didn't, was really, really deeply, deeply upset. He served Hubbard, he loved Hubbard, and how Hubbard's asking assisted suicide. And he just, and he wrote to my dearest friend, who were messengers who lived with Hubbard six, eight hours a day on the Apollo. So I was being told this long before it came out in the book, Going Clear. You know, that was a subsequent book to your masterpiece, Going Clear and the Prison of Belief. So the author, Larry, actually got on videotape the caretaker Sarge telling the story of Hubbard's orders to make the electric shock machine. However, when I heard this, <laughs> see, my whole life, I'd been led to believe psychiatry, that electric shock was the most evil, horrific thing that could happen 
it scrambled your brain it made you crazy you were suicidal after blah 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 and here was hubbard at the end of his life ordering a shock machine any comments now that you've studied being that you've studied hubbard so much in depth well of course i i haven't heard about any of this before but um it didn't necessarily surprise me i mean this is a man who dealt in in um the fiction of his own life uh, for the pretty much the whole of his life and so if he was going to preach one thing to his followers and actually do another um that would actually figure um most of it that's how he lived his life so i mean i'm i'm not necessarily surprised uh, that but um mm. what can yeah. i say but i don't know yeah russell i would like to move on to the fair game the church the cult i i can't even call them a church the cult is still doing to this day if anything more magnified more embellished more the fair game they ran on you so long ago it's it's noted i think even in wikipedia that the cult called scotland yard to say you were an axe murderer true Yes. Well, that well, it, I know I wasn't an axe murderer, but um, they thought I would. They certainly accused me of being an axe murderer. But there was a whole series of dirty tricks even before public before the book was published. The church clearly had got wind of what I was doing, and I had indeed asked for their cooperation, which was refused. And I asked to interview Hubbard, which was refused. Um, but um, uh, you know, we, my publisher and I became both became aware that all kinds of operations were going on to discredit me and um you know they wrote to my publisher and said that i'd been sued for um uh, libel uh, i'd never had and that i was a disreputable journalist and i wasn't and um then i got a call from uh, the cid which is the criminal investigation department in this country asking me where i was on a particular day and i I said, well, I can tell you because I keep a diary. And I looked in the diary and actually there was nothing in the diary. diary so I didn't, wasn't, wasn't able to tell me where I was. But they, they then told me that um, they had information that I'd murdered or that I was, I was possibly a suspect in the murder of a private detective in the car park of a South London uh, pub who had been killed by some hoodlum with an axe in his head. Um, and... Uh, that was the first of a number of accusations that the clearly the church was making against me. That was the first one. Then there was that I would I'd set fire to a helicopter factory in in the north of England somewhere, and clearly <laughs> the the church had mounted what, what for them was a classic sort of dirty tricks campaign. Um, I I learned subsequently that um, they they desperately wanted to get hold of the manuscript, so they sent some operatives to. Um, take the garbage from my publisher day by day and and they'd empty it in a bath or in some apartment they were renting to try and find the manuscript and they never did they also got into the offices of the sunday times which at that time was like a fortress you know the you, you just couldn't get into the whopping plant of the sunday times but they got through uh, right to the office of the of the managing editor uh, to tell them that i was a bad guy and they shouldn't publish anything about my book they the sunday times serialized my book and um so you know, it became clear that there was this major campaign um to discredit me and it almost well what, what happened was that um it seemed to me that a guy called eugene ingrams a private detective in the employee of the church i wondered if there were lots of eugene ingrams because they were popping up everywhere i mean they places where i'd lived in the united kingdom um, I had a once had a flat um, in the Garmin district of of the West End, and they were they were calling on neighbours there, you know, asking if, if they could find out any information about me. And one of the neighbours called me and said, "Look, I had this guy around, called himself Eugene Ingrams, and he's asking about you." And I said, "No, don't worry about it. It's all to do with the um, Church Scientology and the book I'm writing." But I said, "Do you know where he's staying?" And he said, "Yeah, I've got his hotel." So I said, fine, give me the number of the hotel, and I call him. So this was late at night, um, 
one I was living in the country at the time and I so I called the hotel in West London asked to be put through to his room and I said um are you Eugene are you Eugene in Grimsby said, that's me I said, are you inquiring about Russell Miller and he said yeah I am who is this I said this is Russell Miller tell me what do you want to know I'll tell you anything you want to know ask me a question I'll tell you and so he said um I'm I'm going to prove that you murdered Dean Reed in East Berlin. So this is getting more and more bizarre. I mean, this is weird. I'm, I'm an axe murderer and an arsonist, and now I murdered somebody in East Berlin. And this, this is a long story, but, you know, I, there was a, a, an American guy called Dean Reed who defected to East Germany. Uh, he was a pop singer, an uh, American pop singer, and he would discovered that he could resurrect his failing career by going behind the Iron Curtain, which is what he did. And I had arranged to interview him in East Berlin. I'd got to East Berlin and I called his agent and said, OK, I'm ready to do the interview. And um, and they, he said, oh, well, he's not, he's, something's gone wrong. He's not well. You can't do it. Anyway, to cut a long story short, the, um, I, I gave, up the, gave up the assignment, went home. And when I got home, I discovered that actually Dean Reed was dead. And he had subsequently turned out he killed himself I think because he'd become disillusioned with life in East Germany and he was not able to return to the United States because they were very suspicious of anybody who defected understandably so so that fact that I was in East Berlin um, at the time when Dean Reed killed himself who convinced Eugene Ingrams and presumably senior fingers of the church that I was, re I was responsible and what was rather chilling was that they discovered that my wife uh, was born in East Germany. So that they put that as another factor that, you know, here, here was this guy, this suspicious journalist, happened to be in East Berlin at a time when this, to interview this guy who then died because he killed himself. They didn't believe that, that he, that this the journalist was married to somebody who was born in East Berlin. Now that, that was chilling for me because nobody knew outside of myself and my wife that she was born in East Germany. And they, how did they find that out? So they were clearly mounting a major, major investigative project to discredit me. And so, I mean, that was kind of worrying. I thought, well, how did the hell did they find this out? And it ended up this whole saga. Um, then my newspaper, the Sunday Times, started writing stories about the Dirty Tricks campaign that was being um, enacted against me. And they assigned a reporter to find one of these um private detective, not Eugene Ingrams, but another one. Um, and he arrived at the door of this uh, doorstep of this guy with a photographer, and the guy arrived with a gun. And the photographer took a quick picture of um, this guy brandishing a gun, and they, they both scarpered. And it turned out it was a starting pistol. But as the reporter said, perfectly reasonably, I didn't know that at the time, so I ran for it. So that, that was, you know, it seemed bizarre now, but it was... It was actually very debilitating at the time. It was worrying for my family. You know, I've got I had young children. I had to tell the school that nobody could pick them up. That no one was authorized to pick them up. So my wife, myself, and my wife, and she, my wife was, you know, brought down by this because they said that the mail was being intercepted, the house was under surveillance, that I was being tracked around the world every time I went on a foreign assignment, and I that couldn't happen because. If I got an assignment for the Sunday Times, only they knew where I was going to go in the world. And so the, the church couldn't have had people. They said they had people waiting at the airport for me and pick me up. They, how If they were there, they wouldn't know where I was going. You know, I was traveling all over the world. And so uh, there was no possibility of doing this. But nevertheless, for my family, it was a worrying time. And, and you know, you become paranoid about these things. And, of course... All the things that happened to me, nothing was as bad as what happened to Paulette Cooper, which I'm sure you you know all yeah, about. Yeah, 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 yeah. And all you were doing was writing a book. I got to say, you got many honorable awards from the Sunday Times. You were really honored as the prime Sunday Times. I was. I was a working journalist. I was respected by my peers. I think I won quite a few awards um, and I was never accused of any um, uh, malfeasance or any 
no one ever sued me for for libel or slander or anything i'd i'd had a respectable career in a profession that i enjoyed and i loved and i did my best to do it well as well as i could and so i never set out to defame elron hubbard and had i found things about him that were true i was perfectly happy to include them in the book but by and large most of the things i found were not true and so therefore you know i told what i believed to be the truth and the church couldn't handle that right Yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> that you were a murderer, a killer, an arsonist blowing up a factory aviation, an aircraft factory. <laughs> they do really go over the top. They don't give a mediocre little thing. They give something explosive, blood and gore. But that was what Hubbard told them to do in The Guardian guardian orders guardian office orders this came yeah, from hubbard exactly yeah, yeah. Exactly, now yeah. i just on gene yeah. ingram did you know that he was a disgraced lapd cop that they kicked out of the police force because you mean because no, i didn't know that I, I i i only learned that subsequently at the, at the time I, he was just another private investigator and i wondered and I still wonder if a whole lot of other people were deployed calling themselves using Ingram because there were a lot of them around and, and the, you know, the money that the church spent. Um, and th this is not just here, but it was in the United States. I'm, my friends in, in America, I had, you know, I was working a lot in America. I have a lot of American friends. I like America. And so, you know, people were calling me from Washington, from San Francisco, from Colorado, from Chicago, saying, what the hell is going on, Russell? You know, I've just had this guy at the, on my doorstep, Eugene Ingram, so who is he? Because lots of people, were, you know, my friends didn't actually know at that time that I was working on this book. And so um, it was amazing, amazing how much money the, the church had deployed, um, you know, how many people they employed to try and dig up dirt on, on a guy like myself who was pretty much as, as far as i know i'm I, I was blameless i i didn't have any uh, dark secrets to hide and um, i'm sure if i had they would have found them but there weren't there weren't any and so all of this business of trying to discredit me um spending money um you know to to destroy me destroy my reputation it all came to nothing except of course they won in the end in the united states because the book wasn't really published there well, they didn't really win. It was published in multiple countries. And as I told you, there's a revivification coming to life again off the book with all the new. In the last 10 years, there must have been 25 more books, many autobiographical by people who were in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and they write their paint this pain and suffering. And now there's books here, there, and everywhere. If you go to Amazon and just type in the word Scientology, it just goes on and on and on. But yeah, you yeah. were the pioneer yeah. and you were the you you took the brunt of them trying to squash publication of a book. <laughs> well I'm afraid I did, yeah. I mean it's really a damaging book for the Church of Scientology. I understood that. Um but you know what am I gonna do? I'm um I I'd embarked on the book. I had a contract to write the book. Um, I uncovered the facts of, of his life and um, and I put him down and that was it. I mean, you know, but for me, actually, the saddest um, postscript from the book, after the book was published in this country and indeed in, in other countries apart from the United States, that I was inundated with letters from, usually from the parents of young people that, were trapped within Scientology, asking for help, asking for my help. You, know, how can you, could you help me in some way to make contact with my daughter who has been in the church? Such, such, such. And there were a lot of those. They came in by the sackload. And this the tragic thing it was, is, I could do nothing. I mean, I could do absolutely nothing to help them, other than say, well, you know, the book is the story of of the founder of this so-called church, as far as I know, it's as accurate as possible. But I cannot 
provide any with any further information other than the information in the book. And so, you know, I wasn't able to help these poor people who lost contact with their sons and daughters, and I felt very moved for them. It was horrible. Yeah. Now, horrible that I could now, do nothing. Oh, Russell, that's sweet. Now there's a whole organization called the Aftermath Foundation, and they rescue they they get the type of letter you were getting and they rescue if anyone wants to flee and escape they just have to reach the aftermath foundation and they have a conveyor belt doing every, setting them usually staff don't even have a driver's license right. they don't have a bank account they have no savings right. aftermath starts them a new life opens a bank account gets them all the permit, everything they need, and a job. And so now there's a huge organization with a board of directors and so on that support the missing thing that didn't exist. You Did you send some to Paulette Cooper? She was kind of doing a little bit of that. No, I, I wasn't really in touch with Paulette. Um, oh, I oh, only, okay. only met her quite a few years after the book was published. I, and I was very saddened to hear what had happened to her because what she suffered was far, far worse than what that we were put through. Um, and um, you know, ours was I mean, the thing is that you know I was I was a married man. I had family. I had a career. I had a reputation as a journalist. So I was not vulnerable in the way that Paulette was. You know, Paulette was a woman living alone in the, in, in uh, Manhattan, and uh, was much more vulnerable than I was. I mean, we we could we could take precautions um, to minimize the damage they were trying to cause us, um, but you know, in many ways, Paulette couldn't. I mean, nobody, for example, put my wrote my telephone number in pay phones and saying, "Yeah, what a good time! Call Russell at this number." <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. Um, but Paulette, as you know, put up with that, and the nightmarish things happened to her. I mean, she was driven to the close to a total nervous breakdown. But um, that wasn't going to happen for me because of the things I just mentioned. They just even forged her fingerprint being a bomb threatening. Uh, uh, and only because the cult yeah. got raided yeah. in 1977 did the FBI find out she was being framed. Other, she, she stood yeah. to be incarcerated. All fake. All yeah. just intimate you know but just to end off on gene ingram he was running a brothel making money off prostitution and selling drugs while he was in uniform as a cop so he was thrown out of lapd in disgrace and then became a pi that my husband is a licensed private investigator my husband jeffrey he he was the one with doing some setups earlier and Jeffrey, yep, yep. the the rules have tightened up a lot on any illegalities being pulled by people under the license of a private detective, private investigator. The rules have tightened up a lot. Gene Ingram wouldn't last in anyway. He it it's par for the course that the cult would hire a dirty PI. He was dirty. He was always dirty. He, he was yeah, dirty, it, yeah. it, and so he continued to be dirty because a private investigator is not supposed to be an intimidator and a sort of shakedown artist, <laughs> um, which in yeah. the little, in what you covered, it shows that the cult has a whole, it's a spy organization, part of the Church of Scientology is how, how would they find out things like your wife was born in East Berlin? This is they have intelligence. This is well, not ecclesi. Yeah. How, how is this? Uh, that that how was is actually this? the moment when I felt. Well, that was the, the, the when um, when Ingram's revealed that. Um, that was a moment that I felt quite chilled because I realized then that 
they were really digging deep into my whole life. And, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know how they found that out. I mean, so that was sort of worrying. All the other stuff that subsequently came out, how they were trying to track me around the world and, you know, intercept the mail and, and keep surveillance on the house. I was never convinced that was true. But, but clearly they had gone to very, very great lengths um, to dig into my life. And... Um, uh, and and that was a was a worry. Um, I was very glad that I didn't have any anything in particular to hide because they surely would have found it. But I mean, you know, their their efforts efforts to, to discredit me are now part of the kind of folklore of of the whole church, aren't they? Every Scientologist, you yourself included, will know that that's what they do. You know, they if you you you're either with them or you're against them. If you're against them, you're seriously against them, and they'll do everything that they can to uh, destroy you and to damage you. And uh, the, I mean, they in, in they damaged me in as much as the book was never properly published in the United States. But then I got my own back by putting it on the line, online. So you know, anybody who wanted to read the book could go ahead and read it. Um, but um, you know, it was costly for me in terms of income because um, one would have expected the, the book sales would have been substantial in the United States. And of course they weren't. But anyway, there's not water under the bridge now. I don't fret about that anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anything positive you got out of these dark forces and attacks? Did it make you tougher? Did it make you more resolute? Did you discover more about your own strength? Did Was there any good that came out of it? I mean, it's now legendary and, you know... <laughs> You, you, you were. Kind of, well, I mean, I'm, I'm good that it came out. I'm, I'm glad. I mean, I believe that my book tells the real story of L. Ron Hubbard, as far as I was able to ascertain it from records, from interviews. But you know, I, I, I tracked down his wife, his aunt in um, Helena, Montana, who, you know, so I, I did a lot of diligent research, and I talked to people who, who's, who's, who I believed knew the story of L. Ron Hubbard, and so I presented it in the book. So that was the positive outcome, that I believe the book was accurate. I believe that um, uh, you know, it told his story in, in a way that hadn't been told before and should have opened the eyes of Scientologists. Of course, it, I mean, in, in some ways, there's a kind of analogy here with Trump, it seems to me, that you know, here is, here is a, a political party in the United States, apparently many of them believing that the uh, election was stolen by Biden, um, and um, you know, so they convinced themselves that um, this was the case. And similarly, with um, with adherents and followers of L. Ron Hubbard, they convinced themselves that this man, the story that they were given, was the truth, and um, that um, they they were wanted to believe it. I mean, I can understand them understand them wanting to believe it, but I can't understand when they're they were faced with irrefutable evidence that it was wrong, they still believed it. I mean, I did, after the book was published, I did a half an hour live television debate on British television with, uh, with the church had fielded representatives to refute my book. Very personable, very intelligent, young, attractive young people. And and they did a, the best they could to say that I got it all wrong and they got it all right. And in the green room afterwards, I said to one of the, uh, it, one of the people from the church said, "I mean, do you really, do you really, really believe that my book is is wrong and it's all bullshit?" And he looked him in the eye and he said, "I do." I said, "Well, how can you believe that? I mean, here is I've got here is his war record. I here it is the documentary." And he said, "I would well, what you've got, you've got the sheep what they call a sheep dipped record, a, a record of had been falsified to cover his real activities." Behind the lines in in five theaters of war, and I said to him, "Look, if even assuming that was that was the case, if it was a sheep, if they, if his real record was, if the record that I I had found was not the right one, it wouldn't be full of all these discrepancies, all these, you know." People were saying that he, that he was hopeless. So, um, of the of the instance when he was supposed to be fighting some Japanese submarine that nobody could find, that he fired on Mexico by mistake. You know, 
if it, if they sheep dipped the record, it would be seamless. It would be anodyne. There would be not a blip in it. It wouldn't include letters from tailors uh, complaining the bills hadn't been paid. That's not the way you cover up the activities of of this so-called hero. But you know, you're dealing with people who uh, are kind of really they just believe in things so fervently that you can't shake them and. I couldn't shake him, and, and I said, "Well, okay." Then we, I, I said, "Why don't you show you show me your record? Here is mine. Um, I've got it with me. Here are five thousand pages of documentation. If and they, where is yours? Of course, they they said they would show me, but they never did because there there isn't one. It was a nonsense, yeah. of course. It's all lies." Well, good response. That was well well answered. Russell, reflecting on your very extensive career as a journalist, Sunday Times, really the journalist of the decade, you just, and what has been the most memorable and impactful story you got into and that you covered? Not necessarily Hubbard, but it could be Hubbard. And why did it impact and leave such an impression on you? Oh, Karen, you know, I worked for 40 years for the Sunday Times. I, I, I did lots of stories. I mean, the, there was a particular story in, in um, here to do with abuse of children that was very moving to me. And also, um, I did a, I did a, uh, Karen, there were too many stories. Um, oh, and okay. Okay. none really. Too too would many separate yeah. um, as mm. too many yeah yeah okay <laughs> all right let's just let, let let me ask you this one with barefaced messiah you face legal battle after legal battle country after country what was the main lesson learned from navigating these legal battles did you? Did you? Well, the 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 lesson which was, I mean, the 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 lesson that that I, that surprised me is that no one in any court anywhere in the world, in in the United States, in Canada, in South Africa, or Australia, or the United Kingdom, n none of those legal actions contested the veracity of the book. Nobody said, oh, mm. "I'm I'm suing this author mm. because the book is wrong." It was, you know. It was all to do with technical dis issues, whether or not I was breaching confidence, whether or not um, I had the right to use um, stuff that was already on public record. So they're all technical issues, but no one ever stood up in court and said, this book is bullshit. You know, it's, it's, this guy's got it completely wrong. Only the lawyers said that. In in, in um, the, There's something on my bookshelves right here, a, a, writ of, a writ of certiori that went up to the Supreme Court and you know the lawyers then were saying, "Oh, this is this um, barefaced messiah's bullshit. It's full of bullshit." No, it, it wasn't full of bullshit. It was full of facts and accuracy, and um, and it was very insulting to me for them to say that. But it was encouraging that you know that it it would have been easier for them for to for them to stop the book and to sue me if they could say, "Okay." Look at paragraph d da 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 page ninety four. This is wrong. This is completely wrong. Nobody ever did that because it wasn't completely wrong. It was completely right from page one to page whatever it was three hundred and sixty four. No one ever said I got it wrong. I got it right. I told the story of Ella and Hubbard, and nobody can dispute that. No matter how involved they are with the church, that that the story of Ella and Hubbard is right there in the book. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. How do you view the importance of free speech and investigative journalism in the face of such huge entities coming after you legally? What is the importance of having journalists tell that, speak their truths? Well, the, the, the difficulty, um with the Church of Scientology and, and um, anybody doing what I was doing, is that newspapers now, I don't know about 
in the United States, but certainly here, are reluctant to publish stories about the Church of Scientology because they know full well that if they do, they're going to get sued. And, you know, they just think, well, is it worth the trouble? Is it worth the expense? Is it worth the bother when really you know, who cares anymore about these about the Church of Scientology? And so, um, you know, there is a reluctance to... Um, to write or um, or investigate the church because of you know they know that the church is for a ferocious litigant and um, a ferocious litigant and will will come after them, so that's that's a number one problem you know why uh, these things are not being exposed more, and um, to that extent the church has been a success in terms of you know it makes it clear that anybody that's going to start attacking them is going to be attacked back, um, and they they they're going can put be put through all the things that I, or some of the things that I was put through. So, you know, that's a danger. It's a danger to free speech. It's a danger to the First Amendment, for sure. And um, uh, you know, but what can we do about it? While the church adopts the the adversarial and an antagonistic position that it has done throughout its history, and I don't see no reason why it's ever going to change that attitude, then uh, we're stuck with what we got. Well, Russell, let me tell you. The Daily Mail, The Sun, they just pummel Scientology, article after article. The, the Daily Mail has been seriously pissed off by the, and they don't miss a beat. If some Scientologist hurls themselves off a 10th floor building and kills themselves, the Daily Mail make absolutely sure this is linked into that person diligently studying Scientology. and. Um, they've got in-house lawyers that literally laugh at some of the threat letters because it's a cut and paste. They don't originate new threat letters. It's just a rubber stamp of a previous da 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 and we blah, blah, blah. And they're bloviating when they threaten lawsuit. Their bluff has now been discovered. For example, Larry Wright, who wrote the book Going Clear, his publishers received a threat every day, every day, every day, every day, a new, every daily. So they got fed up and they just put them on the web. And uh, oh, they got yeah. laughter. It was hilarious. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Right. That's well, the way to do it. Going Clear yeah. was made into a movie. It came and went. There was no lawsuit. You see, if you're going to bluff and threaten litigation and then you never followed through, sooner or later in this internet world we live in, the word is out that you're just hyperventilating, quacking with no real, no, it's threat. And even Hubbard said, threaten, don't sue, just threaten, threatening them will make them back off. Well, kudos to you. You did not back off. Yeah. You, you held your position, Russell. You, you were strong. You held a position. And the final question, as an accomplished, highly award-winning writer and journalist, what advice would you give to aspiring young writers and journalists coming up the line to capture notable figures in history, because that was a real speciality of yours, not just current affairs, but the the, the book you wrote on the biography. Well, you know, it, it's all it's all to, it's all to do with with hard work, with research, with tra tracking down people, going down every single alley, and um, you know, it, you can't beat um, just straightforward foot slagging research i mean i i traveled around the united states i was fortunate because um uh you know the sunday times was paying for a lot of this because i was in america frequently but i without the backing of the sunday times i wouldn't be able to track down all the people i did but there's no substitute for old-fashioned uh, you know door knocking journalism where you just you know you don't leave a single alley on tracked and um and that's that's the way it is i mean you, you know uh, the, the the book is 
a result of lots of lots of foot slogging and telephone calling and knocking on doors and just checking. You know, I I decided from the start that I would, I would check every single claim that the church made about Hubbard, every single one. I would track it down and try and establish whether it was true or not. And of course, what was wonderfully rewarding for a, a, a journalist like myself is discovering one after another after another that they weren't true, or if they were not overtly untrue, the the truth couldn't be established. Like I, I mentioned earlier, the he, his claim to be the youngest Eagle Scout. Well, the Eagle Scouts of America don't keep the age of their Eagle Scouts, so there's no way he could establish that. So, the, the, you know, that... It was just just the result of a lot of a lot of hard work, and um, there it is. I, I stood by the book then. I stand by it now. I think no one's ever said to me that I've got anything wrong. Even all the years that have passed since the book was published, no one has ever said about any any of it that it was that one thing was wrong it, because it isn't wrong. It's right. That's mm -hmm. the story of his life. Do you have a copy of the book? You can just. Do you have a copy lying around? Well, I've, I've only got this one, which is the uh, Mine, English edition. Yeah. Move um, it a little more. Yes, yes. Russell Miller, Bareface Messiah, L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. Yeah, available on Amazon. Do, yeah, on Amazon. The um, the I, I did have a copy of the American edition, but um, uh, it's pretty rare now, and um, 14,000 copies were printed, but they went mainly to libraries and institutions. And of course, you know, classic thing happened: the church would um, draw the book out of a library, then not not return it, or put an insert in saying this book is wrong. You know, if you want to know about Scientology, you do this or that, that or the other. So they did everything they could, a to even though they accepted that a number of 14,000 copies were, were printed. But most of them disappeared. <laughs> but Russell, just so you know, the cult of Scientology has not sued any journalist or media organization for 20 years. It cost them an arm oh, and really? a leg. Good. 20 years. For 20 years, there's no law. They huff and they puff and they threaten, but then yeah. <laughs> no lawsuit. The reason for this is they sued Time Magazine. Time Magazine, Richard Behar, the, the, the journalist, wrote the cover of Time Magazine, which will be shown in the editing of this, was the cult of power and greed. Scientology, the cult. And they sued, and they sued, and they sued. And it went to Supreme, it was, a 15-year litigation, and they lost every level. It cost them an arm and a leg. You you probably know what lawyers charge, <laughs> but they lost, and oh, it yeah. was worldwide news. You, the first journalists can speak their truth, and after they got burned, burned, slaughtered by losing. Time magazine. They do not sue. 20 years, no lawsuit. Only huffing and puffing. Puffing. <laughs> Russell, Good. this was a wonderful, Good. wonderful. I'm delighted. Uh, I, I want to come and spend an afternoon with you in Brighton uh, on my next trip to England. And um, you were just fabulous. You gave some really, really, really good data points there. Thank you. Thank good. you, Russell. I'm delighted.